Wow, last night was amazing. Many of you know that we have women who go twice a month to the Salvation Army House in Dallas, and they serve the needs of women coming out of the prisons uh, in Texas and in Dallas. And last night we held our annual five-star banquet uh, for all of those women. This room was full, and we had so many great volunteers, including a lot of our teenagers who were here to serve that five-star meal. Uh, we want to thank Tina Silvaggio and Joe Wicks for their leadership it was a wonderful, wonderful evening. And it's always a chance for us not only to, to reach out in terms of providing food, but also a chance for us to share the gospel with uh, so many of these women. And last night, 10 of those young women were baptized into Christ. And so we're celebrating that, the fact that they made commitments to Christ. <clears throat> I want to ask you to continue to pray for those young women as they continue their their journey with the Lord. And of course, that's what it means for us to be a church without walls, right? For us to be reaching beyond the walls of this building. I want to encourage you to continue to do that this fall. I want to remind you that this year we're going to encourage you to take the Fall Fest, which normally we have right here on this property, but to take the Fall Fest to your neighborhood, to your own community. And we've given you some, some suggestions about that. A couple of years ago, Holly and I decided to host a block party, and we rented a, a bounce house, and we, we did the burrs and, and dogs. Now, you don't have to make it that elaborate, but you could do a s'mores bar or a coffee bar. You could do this on Halloween night. You could do it some other night during the next uh, few weeks, but a chance for you to connect with your neighbors. So let me encourage you to forge those connections and to be looking for ways to really be the church without walls right there in your own community to make sure you are developing those relationships. Let's bow and pray. God, we're so very grateful for uh, last night. We thank you for this incredible initiative uh, where young women are touched with the, the good news of Christ. We pray your blessings on, on Joe and Tina and the other leaders of that ministry. We pray God, that you would be with the young women who made commitments to Christ, who confessed their faith. And we ask that you would encourage them and bless them, God, as they walk with, with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk with you today about choices. And, of course, one of the challenges related to our choices is that we have so many choices, just this dizzying array of choices. Listen to this from the Economist Journal. Lattes come in tall, short, skinny, decaf, flavored, iced, and spiced. Jeans come flared, bootlegged, skinny, cropped, straight, low-rise, bleach-rinsed, dark-washed, or distressed. Moisturizer nourishes, lifts, smooths, revitalizes, conditions, firms, refreshes, and rejuvenates. Faces, noses, wrinkles, breasts, and bellies can be remodeled, plumped, or tucked. Teenagers can choose to surf, chat, tweet, zap, or poke in ways that their parents can barely understand. Movies and music can be viewed, recorded, downloaded, or streamed. We seem to have so many choices. And sometimes we think of those choices as a great blessing, but they really can be a source of stress. A source of stress. A 2010 study by researchers at the University of Bristol found that 47% of respondents thought life was more confusing than it was 10 years ago, and 42% reported lying awake at night trying to resolve problems because of the fact that we are blitzed by so many different choices. Sheena Iyengar is a researcher at Columbia University. She found that the average person makes about 70 decisions every day. That's 25,000 500 decisions a year, and over seven years, that's 1,788,500 decisions that you make. The philosopher Albert Camus said, you are the sum total of all of your choices, and that's true, isn't it? You take the composite of all of your choices, that determines who you are. Richard Halverson, for years, was the chaplain for the United States Senate, and he placed this picture before Senators, He said, you're going to meet an old man or a woman someday down the road, 10, 30, 50 years from now, waiting there for you. You'll be catching up with him or her. What kind of old man are you going to meet? He may be a seasoned, soft, gracious fellow, a gentleman who has grown old gracefully, surrounded by hosts of friends, friends who call him blessed because of what his life has meant to them. Or he may be a bitter, disillusioned, dried-up old buzzard without a good word for anyone, soured, friendless, and alone. That old man will be you. 
He'll be the composite of everything you do, say, and think today and tomorrow. His heart will be turning out what you've been putting into it. Every little thought, every deed goes into this old man. Every day, in every way, you are becoming more and more like yourself. Amazing, but true. You're beginning to look more like yourself, think more like yourself, and talk more like yourself. You're becoming yourself more and more. Live only in terms of what you're getting out of life, and the old man gets smaller, drier, harder, crabbier, more self-centered. Open your life to others. Think in terms of what you can give, your contribution to life, and the old man grows larger, softer, kindlier, and greater. Wow, isn't that true? That your decisions, your choices are determining the kind of person you will become, you are becoming. And your choices not only determine your character, they also determine your destiny. You know, in the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy, when the people of Israel are ready to move into the promised land, God, through Moses, describes what's going to happen based upon the choices of the people of Israel. We're going to read three verses out of Deuteronomy chapter 28. I want you to read these with me. First, Deuteronomy 28, verse 13. Let's read this out loud together. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. In other words, if you make decisions, you make choices consistent with the will of God, you're going to be at the top, not at the bottom. Conversely, take a look at the next verse. Let's read it together. Chapter 28, verse 65. There the Lord will give you an anxious mind, eyes weary with longing, and a despairing heart. You will live in constant suspense, filled with dread both night and day, never sure of your life. That will be the consequence that will accrue to you if you choose not to obey God. Now Moses goes on in this text to detail so many other blessings and curses that would come to the people of Israel if they make certain decisions. And let's read together chapter 30, verse 19. I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. So that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life. Choose life. Make decisions, make choices that are consistent with life. Now, one of the problems is sometimes we have a hard time making decisions. You know, that great American theologian Yogi Berra said, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. So sometimes we're kind of that way. But every decision that you make moves you either in the direction of heaven or in the direction of hell. And if you don't believe that, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 13. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Listen, your life is all about choices. And Jesus' words in this text practically leap off the page. He says there are two different ways. There is the narrow gate that leads to the narrow road that leads to life. Or, on the other hand, there is the broad gate that leads to the wide road that leads to destruction. Now, we've been talking about going all in for God. And if you're going to go all in for God, you've got to choose the narrow gate. You've got to choose the narrow road. And we really don't like that. You know, we want a nice six-lane freeway with roomy ramps. We don't want that narrow mountain road. And who is the road? Who is the way? Well, Christ is the way. Listen to John 10, verse 9. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. This word enter is an imperative verb. It implies a sense of urgency. He's saying you've got to do this right now. You enter through the narrow gate. But again, one of our challenges is we have so many choices in this culture. I read the other day where Starbucks can make coffee 19,000 different ways. So when Christ comes along in that kind of context and he says, you got two choices, we think, man, Jesus is so narrow-minded. We think there's got to be a third way. You know, there's a a way that's narrow for preachers and missionaries, and there's a 
wide way that's for sinners headed to hell, and surely there's some kind of middle path. There's a middle ground for the rest of us. But Jesus says, no. There's a narrow way, and there is a wide gate. Jesus' words sound numbingly narrow to us just because we live in this, this culture with multiple choices. Well, in Luke 13, verse 24, Jesus goes on to drill down on the importance of following the narrow way. Listen to what he says. Make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Now, there are two things about that sentence that strike me. First of all, it takes effort to enter the narrow way. It takes effort. The Greek word that's used here for effort is the word agonizomai. It means to agonize. It means to strain toward. It means that you, you stress, you are working toward that goal. It's the same word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 9.25 when he talks about an athlete. And he says an athlete agonizomize. He agonizes. He works hard. He pushes toward the, the goal line. Paul also uses the word in 1 Timothy 6, verse 12, when he talks about fighting the good fight. You remember, I fought the good fight, I finished the course, I've kept the faith. He says, I've agonized so as to fight the good fight. Now, don't misunderstand. We're not talking about salvation by works. We're not talking about achieving your salvation. There are only two religions in the world, the religion of human achievement and the religion of divine accomplishment. And Christianity is the only one of divine accomplishment. It says when you put your trust in Christ, all the perfection of Jesus is then conferred upon you. You are treated as if you are perfect. He sees you as perfect. You can't buy salvation. You can't earn it. You can't merit it. You can't bargain for it. You can't negotiate. It's all compliments of God's grace. But here's the paradox. Even though it is a gift... It costs you everything. It demands everything from you. There are a lot of people out there who think they, you know, they want information, but they don't want transformation. They want to buy in, but they're not ready to buy in at the cost of giving up their life. And then sometimes people are reluctant to do this because they think, well, if I, if I go all in for God, then I'm going to lose out. And that's the lie that Satan has been trying to pawn off on people since Adam and Eve. You don't lose out, you gain. But you've got to go all in. You know, there were a lot of people who wanted to, to admire Jesus, but they didn't really want to follow him. And you see this in John chapter 6. You remember, Jesus is, is teaching, and he's, he's multiplying the loaves, and people love to, bukus of people love to follow Jesus because of the bread. But then a lot of those would-be followers drop out. When Jesus starts talking about the demands of discipleship, listen to Jesus in or John 6, verse 66, as it talks about what happened. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. People, a lot of people admired Jesus, but not everybody was ready to follow. There's a huge difference between being an admirer and a follower. How many of you watched the Summer Olympics this summer? How many of you would say that, that you would admire Michael Phelps as an athlete? Probably a lot of us as an athlete. Amazing that he brought home so many medals, something like 20 medals, historic records. But you know, even though there are a lot of us who would admire Michael Phelps, probably not many of us would be able to say, I would qualify as a follower of Michael Phelps. Because we would applaud his accomplishments. We would say, man, that was great. But we're not ready to make the sacrifices that he made to accomplish what he accomplished, right? But somewhere out there this summer, there was some kid watching. And he was watching Michael Phelps. And as he watched, his heart started pounding. And his mind started racing. And he started thinking, you know, maybe someday I could swim like Michael Phelps. And he's doing more than just applauding Michael Phelps, more than just admiring him. He's watching videos, and he's swimming laps, and he's hiring a coach. And someday, someday, he'll swim like Michael Phelps. 
There are a lot of people who admire Jesus, but not many who are ready to follow. There are a lot of people who admired Martin Luther King, but not many people who were ready to have their house bombed like he was willing to experience. Not many people who were ready to go to prison like he was willing to go to prison. And in Jesus' day, there were a lot of people who were would-be followers. They'd admire Jesus from a distance, but only a few, when they heard the word of Christ, their hearts started pounding. Their minds started racing. And they thought to themselves, this is it. This is what I want. This is what I've looked for my whole life. I want freedom from guilt. I want freedom from fear. I want to have the joy of Christ. Only a few who are willing to lay down their lives for Christ. Here's how John Ortberg put it. If you ask folks in the admiring Jesus category, do you believe in Jesus They would most likely say, sure, I believe in my own way. They may go to church maybe for years. They may volunteer sometimes. They may give some stuff. But they want to retain control of their lives. If getting too close to Jesus would mean risking something they don't want to risk, like their success at work, or changing their lifestyle, or humbling themselves to get help with a crumbling marriage, or getting serious about immersing their mind in Scripture rather than just drifting along, or not sleeping anymore with somebody they aren't married to, or getting help with their anger or some habit they have, then deep down in the secret place of their soul, they want to be able to say no. They want to be able to say to God, hands off, this life is my life. So they admire Jesus, but they will try to maintain a certain distance between them and Jesus. Now, if that distance gets too big, if they slip up somehow and sin in what looks to them like a big way, they might come to church a little more often. They may give a little extra money. They don't want to let the gap get too great because that would feel uncomfortable, but they won't let him get too close. In other words, they are not all in. It takes effort to enter the narrow gate. And the second thing that strikes me is this. Many will try to enter and not be able to. They'll not be able to. Now, why would people try to enter the narrow gate but not be able to get through? It's because the narrow gate is like a turnstile. It only permits entrance by one person at a time. You don't go through the narrow gate as a group. You don't get to go through the narrow gate just because of your church membership or because of your family heritage. You know, some people are trying to to get to heaven on somebody else's coattails. Well, grandmother was a Christian. My spouse is a Christian. Some people that I know follow Christ. And so somehow they think that by association, that's going to get them through the narrow gate. Salvation is intensely personal. It requires a personal commitment to Christ. Some of you can't get through the narrow gate because of moral wrong in your life. There's some kind of hatred that you're harboring against somebody else, and you're just feeding that that bitterness. Or maybe for you it's lust. You think somehow you can kind of slip your lust through the narrow gate. That you can keep looking at pornography on the internet or maybe you can keep sleeping with somebody who's not your spouse and you're trying to kind of wedge that through the narrow gate. You're going to try to sneak that in. Jesus says no. Or maybe you're trying to get your gossip and criticism of other people through the gate. Jesus says you've got to drop that at the door otherwise you can't get in. Some of you may not be able to get through the narrow gate because of sinful attitudes. Maybe there's a, a racist spirit in you. Or maybe there's somebody that you, you really kind of salivate about the prospect of that person suffering. You, you kind of fantasize about what could go wrong in that person's life. And you're just feeding, again, that spirit of resentment. You're trying to kind of slip that through the narrow gate. And Jesus says you can't do it. Some of you can't get through the narrow gate because of self-righteousness. You might be surprised. You might find... Some people in this church who think they're better than people who live a homosexual lifestyle. Or who think they're better than people who smoke and drink. Or they think they're better than people coming out of prison. Or they think they're better than Methodists or Presbyterians or Episcopalians. You might find somebody in this church who's parading his piety. And Jesus says you can't get through the narrow gate if that's what your life is about. Some of you may not be able to get through the narrow gate because of materialism. I mean, you want to go through the narrow gate, but you want to take all your stuff with you. 
You, know, you, you want to drive your car and drive your big house and the closet crammed with clothes through the narrow gate? And maybe Jesus is saying, you know what? Instead of more, maybe you need less. Maybe you need to downsize. Maybe material things are keeping you from being able to go through the narrow gate. I thought about the rich young ruler this week. You know, he comes to Jesus, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, here's what you got to do because he knows what this guy's issue is. He says, well, you got to go and sell what you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me and then you find treasure in heaven. And what could have been the young man's greatest moment becomes his worst moment because he thinks holding on to his stuff is what's going to make him happy. And instead, Jesus says, you've got to let go of it. And so he walks away sad because he's got a lot of stuff. And there came a point where the rich young ruler became the rich old ruler. And I wonder if at that point in his life, maybe he looked back and he thought, you know what? I let the opportunity slip out of my hands. I, I didn't have the guts to go for it. Jesus was saying, you've got to push all your chips to the center of the table. But I, did, I didn't do that. I didn't double down on God. Ron Sider wrote a book called Christians in an Age of Hunger, and he said as, as we become more and more upwardly mobile, which is most of us, we should consider the possibility not only of giving more money but a greater percentage of our income to God, going from 5 to 10% or 10 to 15 or 15 to 20 Rich Mullins was a contemporary Christian singer who started making a lot of money a few years ago because of his recordings. And he made the decision that he would cap his income at the level of the average American worker and then just give the rest to God. Think about what it is maybe you need to jettison so that you can get through that narrow gate. Now, our problem, of course, is we don't want to choose. We love the land of indecision. And we're kind of like the people in 1 Kings chapter 18. You remember them? They wanted to give a nod to God and then worship idols the rest of the time. They wanted to have it both ways. They wanted to sit on the fence. They wanted to worship idols but also pretend to worship God. And the prophet Elijah just booms out this challenge to the people of Israel. 1 Kings 18 verse 21. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And the word waver here literally means to dance on one foot and then another. They're wavering back and forth and back and forth. They're trying to have it both ways. And Elijah says, you can't do it. You can't go on limping between two opinions. You've got to make a decision. Are you going to choose to go all in for God or not? Well, what is it that causes us to waver? Sometimes we waver because we allow good intentions to get in the way of clear decisions. Good intentions get in the way of clear decisions. Frank Harrington is a preacher and there was a guy in his church who came to him and, and the man's uh, family was, was really suffering because of the man's neglect and he was feeling bad about the consequences of the neglect and he said to, to Frank Harrington, he said to the preacher, you know I, I meant to do better, doesn't that count for something? And Frank Harrington said, well no, not really. See there's a huge difference between meaning to do something and doing something there are some people in this church who are bpo members burial purpose only members and they say to themselves you know what i mean i mean to be consistent in worshiping i mean to be developing a quiet time i mean to be involved in ministry but they never get to it You can't enter the narrow gate that way. And then sometimes we waver because we let procrastination get in the way of clear decisions. Procrastination. You know, some people are going to lose their souls because they keep deferring a decision to follow Christ. David Brainerd was a missionary to the American Indians, and one day he was talking to the chief of the tribe. And he sensed that the chief was about ready to make a decision to follow Christ, but he wasn't quite ready to pull the trigger. And so Brainerd took a stick and he drew a circle around the chief in the soft earth and he said, now, chief, I want you to decide before you cross this line. You know why he did that? Because he realized in that moment the chief was, he had a disposition to go ahead and follow Christ, but if he didn't take advantage of that moment, he might never do it. 
And if I could do that for you, I'd do the same thing. I'd take that stick and I'd draw it around you and I would say, decide before you cross the line. Satan calls some of his apprentices trying to decide which one he would send to the earth. And he said to the first, if I send you to the earth, what will you tell the children of men? He said, I'll tell them there is no heaven. And then the second came. He said, what will you tell people if I send you to the earth? He said, I will tell them there is no hell. The third apprentice appeared. He said, what will you tell the children of men if I send you? He said, I will tell them there is no hurry. And immediately God said, or Satan said, you go. Tell people there is no hurry. Go home this afternoon and read James chapter 4. James 4, 14. Your life is a mist that appears for a moment and then it's gone. That's how quickly our lives go by. Some of you have kids who graduated last year from high school. You think about how quickly those 17 years went by. And you think about how fast the next 17 years are going to go by. And what are you doing today, today, in this moment, to make a decision to affect all of eternity? And then sometimes we waver because of the denial avoidance syndrome. You know, some people never make a decision because they refuse to face reality. It's like the alcoholic who says, I, I can quit drinking anytime I want to. I don't have a drinking problem. It's just a nip here and there. They're stuck in denial. And I've seen people do this with reference to food and sex and power. And they're just stuck in that syndrome where they refuse to face up to the reality of their need to obey God and obey Him immediately. Henry Blackaby said, The first funeral I ever conducted was for a beautiful three-year-old. She was the first child born to a couple in our church and the first grandchild in their extended family. Unfortunately, she was spoiled. While visiting the little girl's home one day, I observed that she loved to ignore her parents' instructions. When they told her to come, she went. When they said, sit down, she stood up. Her parents laughed, finding her behavior cute. One day, their front gate was inadvertently left open. The parents saw their child escaping out of the yard and heading toward the road. To their horror, a car was racing down the street. As she ran out between two parked cars, they both screamed at her to stop and turn back. She paused for a second, looked back at her parents, then gleefully laughed as she turned and ran directly into the path of the oncoming car. The parents rushed their little girl to the hospital, but she died from her injuries. As a young pastor, this was a profound lesson for me. I realized I must teach God's people not only to recognize His voice, but also immediately to obey His voice when they hear it. It is life. We have to learn the importance of obedience and of immediate obedience. C.S. Lewis said, every time you make a choice... You're turning the central part of you that chooses into something a little different from what it was before. And taking your whole life, or your life as a whole, with all your innumerable choices, all your life long you are slowly turning this central thing either into a heavenly creature or into a hellish creature. Either into a creature that is in harmony with God or else into one that is in a state of war and hatred with God and with itself. To be the one kind of creature is heaven. That is, it is joy and peace and knowledge and power to be the other means madness, horror, idiocy, rage, impotence, and eternal loneliness. Each of us at each moment is progressing to the one state or the other. So the question I have for you this morning is, in which direction are your choices moving you? You know, those questions that I raised earlier are significant questions. Why are you here? What do you need? What do you want God to say to you? Because those questions have a way of burning away all the defense mechanisms we usually build up against change. Defense mechanisms against change read like a book. Denial, I don't need to change, everything's fine. Blame, well, there are some changes that are necessary, but they're everybody else's fault. Defensiveness, well, that's just your opinion. Vindictiveness, yes, changes are necessary, and it's all your fault, and if you don't get out of my way, I'm going to sue you. Now, the thing about this is, the result of our choice is monumental. There's really no way for me to overstate the significance of the choice that you make. Because Jesus says, if you choose the narrow road, you find life. If you choose the broad road, you find destruction. 
And that word destruction is a horrible word. It means the destruction of love and joy and peace. It means the destruction of, of a chance to know the love and the life of God. It means the destruction of your soul. Now, sometimes people want to know, is it harder or easier to be a Christian? Well, it's hard to be a Christian, but it is infinitely tougher not to follow Christ. Infinitely tougher. Listen to Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry, carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden, the burden I give you, is light. A life of sin is much tougher than a life without it. I could tell you hundreds of stories of people who've chosen to live apart from Christ and their lives are like broken shells, just one misery on another, on another, on another. And then I could tell you about thousands of Christ followers who've made the decision to follow him and they would say, I'd make that choice a million times over. Why are you here? What do you need? What do you want God to say to you? You know, Christ is the only one to bring about the possibility of forgiveness for your sin and mine. And he doesn't present himself as this good, innocuous, polite, respectable teacher. He presents himself as somebody who makes a demand on your life. And he says, you've either got to follow me or you'll find the wide gate. But there's, there are only two choices. There's not a third camp. There's not a third way for polite, respectable uh, admirer giving kinds of disciples. There's only, only the way of Christ that demands that you pick up the cross and follow him. Let's bow and pray.